Hi, you're listening to Hear This Idea, a podcast showcasing new thinking from top academics at the University of Cambridge and beyond. In this episode, we discuss corruption and political economics more generally with Dr. Toke Eid, who is Director of Studies in Economics at Jesus College, Cambridge, and Director of the Keynes Fund. We begin by talking about why some economists have argued that political corruption can actually be a force for good, or at least the lesser of two evils, before Toke explains why he believes this view does not hold up to scrutiny. We then explore other models of corruption, particularly the idea that it can be self-reinforcing, as well as what role culture might play in all of this. We cover a lot of ground in this episode, summarising the existing literature as well as Toke's own work. So if you are at all interested in any of the papers mentioned or want to explore political economy more, I highly suggest you look at the accompanying write-up. But without any further to do, here's the episode. So my name is uh, Toke Eid, and then I'm an economist in the Faculty of Economics in, in Cambridge and also the Director of Studies at one of the colleges, Jesus College. Um, I've been working for many years uh, in a field called political economics, which is at the borderline between economics and political science. And one of my uh, main research interests is corruption. And could I ask what um, attracted you to economics or more specifically political economics in the, in the first place? Well, it actually goes all the way back to when I was applying for universities. I'm a Danish and therefore I applied for a Danish university back in the time when I had to go to the university. And I could really not make up my mind whether I should go for economics or political science. And at the end, um, I almost just flipped a coin and it became economics, <laughs> which I was kind of happy with. Uh, I enjoyed doing that, but I always, always had that interest in political science. And um, having a sort of firm education in economics with all the tools that economics give you in terms of mathematical modeling and statistical analysis was actually a very good way of moving into the political science part of it. At the time I did that, when I was doing my PhD, it was sort of a fringe subject. Not very many economists was uh, working in that that area. But nowadays it's booming. Lots of people are doing political economics and uh, lots of the journals are publishing on it. Lots of books are being published on it. So it sort of turned into sort of a field that has really expanded. And I think one of the reasons is that economists actually have something useful to contribute to that area. So before we get into the topic uh, for today, which is corruption, um, could I just ask, like, when kind of what that boom? When did that start happening? And do you have any idea what kind of caused it? It started in the mid 90s. And I think what uh, I think there were two things that, that basically drew it. I think fundamentally, I think a lot of economists have for a long time been unhappy with the idea that we should think about governments as sort of benevolent planners that that introduce policy in order to intervene in the economy in an optimal way, which is the traditional way uh, that economists have viewed public policy, that is, as an optimization problem. There is a problem with the economy. The government has some tools. What is the best way that the government can intervene in order to fix the problems? And that would then be the policy recommendation. But realizing that these policy recommendations are pretty much ignored by policymakers, uh, has made a lot of economists think that maybe that's not the way we should we should actually think about policy making. So that was sort of one reason. More specifically, uh, as it sometimes happens, a couple of very important papers got published in the early 1990s, which caught a lot of interest from younger researchers, which are not normally thinking about political economy or political economics, but got inspired by that. So there's an important paper in trade policy called Protection for Sale, which really started a lot of research. And it was also the time where <coughs> Darren Asamoglu and James Robinson started their work on institutions and economic development. So these things sort of happened more or less at the same time during that period, and I think inspired a lot of people to, to move into the field. Great. So talking about this idea that governments aren't benevolent, uh, we want to talk about corruption today. So can I start off just very simply asking you to explain what corruption is and why it might be something that we should care about? Yes, yeah, so we all know the term. It's commonly used. We know about corrupt policemen, corrupt politicians, and we might even sort of talk about corrupt systems or corrupt political systems and so on. Uh, so it's a term that is sort of used a lot in common, in common language. Now, economists uh, like to be more specific than this. So we have sort of a specific definition that we are using. We are thinking about corruption as misuse of public office for private, for private gain. 
So that would be the sort of way that we are trying to narrow it down. And it can care, it sort of covers a lot of different activities going from bribes to extortion to favoritism and so on. So it's a whole bunch of activities, but they all share the common feature that it's about misuse of public office for private gain, that is bending some rules that should not be bent in a way that, uh, that, that basically delivers some private gains for the people who might be doing it. So we will be talking about three kind of interpretations of corruption and how we can kind of model that. But the first one that I kind of want to talk about is the idea of efficient corruption, because, you know, generally when we talk to each other, we always think of corruption as something bad and something that we should uh, be trying to stop. But some political economists have actually argued the opposite, that it can be a useful feature or a, a necessary one, at least. Um, could you kind of talk about that view? Indeed. So if we go back to the definition, then it, it sort of suggests that this is supposed to be bad because there's sort of the term misuse in the definition. So it almost leads us to immediately to the conclusion that this cannot be a, a socially beneficial activity. Uh, but despite that, there are actually people who have been arguing uh, for a long time that corruption can be a force for good, can improve economic efficiency, make things, make, make things better. Um, the first person to sort of put that on paper was a, uh, a social scientist called Nathan Len, uh, Leff, sorry, that wrote an article about that in the mid-1960s, where he put the, sort of broadly put the idea out that uh, corruption is just a rational response to uh, pre-existing government failures and inefficient policies. And he used sort of an example to sort of explore that idea um, his example had to do with price control. So if you imagine that a, an economy tried to put some caps on what prices, how fast prices can, can increase, perhaps because they're really dealing with an, a situation of inflation, then of course if you put a cap on prices, that means that there's going to be a supply so shortage. And that's of course not desirable in itself. So he was then comparing two different ways that uh, a bureaucracy might, might uh, deal with this restriction that is coming in on prices. If one bureaucracy might be totally honest and just do as the government says, implement the target, and as a consequence of that you get lots of shortage and people cannot get the, uh, the goods that they, they want. Another bureaucracy in some other country might do the opposite. This might be a super corrupt bureaucracy that's willing to bend the rules if, for example, they offer bribes in exchange for doing so. And in that society, the rules will not be enforced at all they're being circumvented because of, of corruption and bribery, and as a consequence, shortage is not happening. So in that case, corruption improves the allocation of resources by helping the individuals to sort of overcome some inefficient government intervention that has uh, that basically been put in place. So I think historically he kind of gave the example of Chile and Brazil as well, with Chile having that honest bureaucracy that ended up implementing a lot of bad policies, but in Brazil, where there was more corruption, that actually sabotaged a lot of ineffective policy, ending up uh, actually helping consumers. Yes, uh, that's, ex that's exactly right. So that's the precise example he's using at the time. Uh, whether it's true or not that uh, there was that <laughs> difference in cor <coughs> corruption in these two particular bureaucracies, I'm not, I'm not, so, not so sure. But the example is that, and the general point of it is that if there is a pre-existing government intervention that creates bottlenecks, red tape and so on, then the uh, the private sector might be able to overcome that if they can find some officials that are willing to bend the rules, for example, in exchange for bribes. And that might then allow the economy to run more smoothly. So that's the general point that, that Lev put on the table. And it's a point that has appealed to many, many economists who have gone on to develop what is called the greeting the wheels hypothesis, so this idea that corruption can speed up uh, bureaucratic uh, processes that otherwise would be very slow, how you can circumvent inefficient red tape in the bureaucracy and so on, and just get things uh, done much more effectively. Uh, so could you walk us through an example of this kind of greasing the wheels model? Yes, so there's a, there is a sort of a good example that was developed by, by another economist in an interesting theoretical paper. Uh, some years ago, which has to do with uh, how you allocate uh, licenses. So if you imagine that there's a number of licenses that have to be allocated to firms, uh, 
And some firms can use the licenses more effectively than others, so it's important who gets the licenses. But the bureaucracy in charge of handing out the licenses cannot really see who is the most effective users of the licenses. And of course, everybody who's coming for a license will say that they are the best to have the license. So, so it's hard to get that information. Uh, <clears throat> in a situation like that, you can see that there might be a way that corruption can actually help allocate the licenses in the right way. Because the ones who are able to use the licenses more effectively were willing to pay more to get them. So if they could find a corrupt bureaucrat who is willing to, uh, to sell the licenses for, for a bribe, then the ones who are going to pay the most, the most effective users of licenses, are going to get the licenses first. And the ones which are less effective at using them would not be willing to pay that much, and they're going to be at the back of the queue. So in that way, you would basically get an allocation of the licenses which is efficient from a social point of view. The users of the licenses that are most effective would get the licenses, and the ones which are less effective are going to be rationed out. So this would be an example where corruption can help basically organize the allocation of a scarce resource in a more effective way than otherwise. Where in the absence of corruption, maybe it would be just allocated at random and therefore some ineffective and inefficient users would get it and some effective ones would get it, but we would not know for sure. So um, at the moment, all of this sounds pretty great, right? It's kind of telling us that corruption isn't really something we should be worrying about, that it's effective responding to, to government failures. But that's not the view of everyone, and as I understand it as well, that's not the view um, that you have. Um, could you explain what your issue is with this interpretation? <clears throat> yeah, so the, at some level, this idea of corruption being efficient has some intuitive appeal and also has some appeal to economies. So the example I gave about uh, organizing the how you're going to allocate licenses through this mechanism sounds very much like an auction, mm. right? This is effectively what it, what it turns into, that you get the bidders, but it's an illegal auction, of course. So economists can sort of like this, in general, like these ideas because they, they sort of resemble things we understand and we know work well in other contexts and they can then be applied to this idea of bribery and efficient allocation. But underlying all that, there is a, a fallacy, uh, which I call the fallacy of efficient corruption. Now, the problem is actually quite easy to see. <clears throat> now, if you are corrupt or corruptible official that would like to collect some bribes, how do you do it? Well, you do it by creating artificial scarcity because this is what is needed to get somebody to pay for the, for the item that you're trying to hand out. So I mean, in a license system, for example, we just talked about, if there was enough license to go around so everybody could get one, then of course nobody would be willing to pay anything to get a license. So in order to be able to collect bribes in that uh, scenario, what you need to do as a bureaucrat is to restrict the number of licenses which is available so they become scarce, and now they become valuable. And that means there will be agents in the private sector that will then be willing to pay for it. So now there's corruption potential. So if we put these things together, then what that leads to is the conclusion that these inefficient policies, the corruption is supposed to overcome the restricted license system or the price control and so on, might actually have been put in place in the first, put in place in the first place, because they have the, that's the way you generate the corruption potential. Indian economy, for example, for many many years up until the 1990s, when they liberalised the economy, had a very elaborate system of industrial licences. So if you wanted to be a producer of something. Uh, it could be water bottles, or uh, you might want to produce uh, machinery. So anything, basically, you needed an industrial license to set up a factory to do that. And that system served very effectively to restrict entry into a particular industry, and therefore made these licenses extremely valuable in industries where there was uh, a lot of demand. Now, the Indian government, at least not at first, set this system up in order to generate a lot of corruption possibilities for its mm. bureaucracy, it set it up because it has a development plan and wanted to allocate resources using sort of a planned system. But the consequence of it was that a lot of bureaucrats were then being put in positions where they actually could collect, collect a lot of bribes and a lot of corruption arose from that. So this would be a concrete example of that. You have a licensing system where you basically need to get, uh, get hold of a license in order to be allowed to produce. But you can think of many other examples. Many cities have a licensing system for taxis. Mm. 
you can't just start being mm-hmm. a taxi. And this is not so true anymore because of uh, the various other alternatives that we know how now have. But at least sort of going back some time, this was exactly how it works. In the <coughs> yeah, exactly. Like in a, indeed. And these uh, licenses sell for very high mm-hmm. prices and not supposed to be sold for high prices in the private market. So this is sort of another example of how a licensing system creates uh, artificial scarcity and therefore the item becomes valuable and then people are willing to pay for it. And that generates a corruption opportunity. And therefore it's a bit hard to argue that then the corruption that is then happening to overcome those obstacles is good. If the corruption is there in the first place, or the inefficiencies are there in the first place because of the corruption mm-hmm. potential that it creates. It kind of takes us back to square one, and it's, uh, it's, uh, the argument becomes, uh, so to say, untenable. It's not. The question is, why do we have the inefficiencies in the first place? Not whether corruption, once we have them, can help the economy function a little bit better or worse. Mm-hmm. So overall, just to, to summarize what you said, um, it's the idea that corruption actually um, creates the, these government obstacles or inefficiencies because corrupt politicians have an incentive to keep licenses or the like artificially scarce because if everyone could have them, then nobody would be willing to pay a bribe uh, in order to get them in the first place. Exactly. This is exactly the point. And that, I think, undermines the whole idea that corruption can be viewed in general as something that is efficiency enhancing. It, it is not the case. So um, if we're saying, okay, corruption isn't um, efficient, then we need to come up with another kind of idea. And this is kind of what you've alluded to with the the grabbing hand view. Um, Could you talk about that and what kind of empirical evidence um, there is for that? Yes, uh, there has, of course, been an enormous interest in investigating these things empirically to try to quantify the costs of this and also just basically find out which of these different interpretations might be the right one. Uh, The first problem you have if you want to uh, do empirical research on corruption is that you need to be able to measure corruption. And of course, it's not something that is recorded in the national statistics. Uh, It's mostly it's illegal and it's under the radar. Uh, So it's not something you can just go out and look up on the uh, in the statistics. So you need to find a way of measuring it. So uh, back in the mid 1990s and uh, as an organization called uh, Transparency International came up with the idea of measuring corruption as a corruption perception index. And that started a whole industry of research which is using that idea. So a corruption perception index is based on basically survey data where you go out and ask people who either work or live in a particular society about how much corruption they perceive there to be in that society. And then you aggregate all these surveys up so you get a number for a particular country, then you can compare countries. And if you do that every year, you can compare a country across time as well. So we you would get data like that that would allow you to track corruption across time and space. And you get kind of a ranking where the most corrupt country and the least corrupt country can sort of be compared, which was the purpose of making the index in the first place to make basically put spotlight on this. But researchers have then picked that up because what you can then do is you can then ask, right, if we're interested in what is, for example, a relationship between corruption and economic growth, we have the possibility to do a statistical study now where we can use the corruption perception index uh, as the variable that we are trying to use to explain the growth rates across countries and across time and see what the relationship is. Um, So there's been an awful lot of research done in that sort of area. And that can actually be used to make a it makes the distinction between this idea that corruption is, is having a social cost and corruption is efficiency enhancing because that should have different implications for what the relationship between corruption and economic growth should be. So if corruption is efficiency enhancing, there should be a positive relationship, more corruption, more growth. Mm. That's how we get the government, the economy going. But if it is not like that and it's more like what I'm arguing, that it's uh, actually detrimental, to economic efficiency, we should see a negative relationship. So if you run some statistical models on on this relationship, what you broadly speaking find is a weak negative relationship between corruption perceptions and economic growth. It's not a very strong negative relationship, but it's definitely not positive. Mm 
So um, one thing that you pointed out as well in, in your paper is that the relationship is or may not be non-monotonic, so it's not just a straight line. Yeah. Um, do you care to elaborate about that at all? Yes, this is exactly where you can, you can get some, some, <clears throat> some leverage on the distinction between these different theories, because if we've got to be fair to the uh, efficient uh, corruption theory, mm. it's not saying that there should be a positive relationship between corruption and economic growth everywhere. Mm. What it is saying is, is it says that there should be a positive relationship in places where there are lots of inefficient policy and regulation that corruption can help circumvent. This is where you should see the effect. Mm. It should not have a positive effect in a, in a country where, where there is not a lot of these inefficiencies to be overcome. So there has to be something to grease for it to work. Uh, but that actually gives you a way of testing it empirically because what you would then expect is exactly a non monotonic relationship. So what you would have to do is you could sort of imagine that we could divide countries, if we have a sample of countries, into two types, countries with lots of inefficient regulation and countries with uh, little or no inefficient regulation, just to take the, the most extreme example. Then we would expect, if you look at the relationship between corruption and economic growth, we would then expect there should be a negative relationship in the countries which has the uh, has no of none of these inefficient regulations. That's, but that that negative relationship should be less, or perhaps even turn positive, when we are looking at the countries with all the inefficient regulation. Mm. So you can estimate a statistical model like that, and you would get, uh, then be able to answer that question: Is it true that uh, corruption has a less negative, or maybe even a positive effect, in countries with lots of inefficient policy? or inefficient institutions, so whatever way you want to, to measure that. And what do you find when you, when you run Well, it? if you run these uh, sort of uh, estimations, uh, you do find evidence that sort of point in that direction. Uh, the question then you are sort of left with once you have done that is what is the interpretation of it? So there's sort of at least two ways you can interpret that. One is to say, well, yes, this is evidence that Corruption can be helpful in cases where there's lots of inefficiencies in accordance with the greasing the wheels hypothesis mm. and efficient corruption. The other one is that you could also say that um, what is actually going on is that in, in countries which has lots of inefficiencies uh, in the first place, it's hard to see how things could get any worse. So therefore having more or less corruption is not going to have much of an effect. Mm. And maybe it has, uh, so therefore it would have less of a negative effect than it has in places where things are actually running pretty well. And that sort of analysis cannot distinguish between these two explanations. And I, get that, uh, I guess that gets at the more, more general problem that economics sometimes has as well, which is, uh, as you said, um, even if we have the same association between two variables, being able to identify the exact causal mechanism is very hard to do. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. yeah, it's the, the yeah. big challenge that we Indeed. Facing. I mean, you, it's actually very clear with the, um, if you are thinking about the corruption perceptions and economic growth, that mm -hmm. there's a real problem there. Because if you have one, if one is wondering, if when people say that a society in these surveys that underline the perception index that is being used there, when they say that a country is doing has a lot of corruption, they're presumably looking at how the country is doing in all kinds of dimensions, including how it's doing economically. Mm. So it's very easy to imagine that uh, if an economy is doing really badly and then somebody comes and asks you how corrupt is the political class here, how inefficient and corrupt is our yeah. bureaucracy, then you might say that they are really corrupt because things are going so badly. And that therefore create an artificial uh, correlation between the, the perceptions that you measure and the economic outcome that you are, you are trying to estimate the effect on, which would make it very difficult to establish which way the causality goes. So it's very possible that there's reverse causality in this and all kinds of other statistical problems can emerge as well. That point that uh, uh, that, that this corruption sort of is a necessary uh, ingredient to get the economy to work is actually important there to look at some microeconomic evidence on, on that mm. particular point because this can only be true if you can actually find uh, when you study this at the microeconomic level, that is when you're looking at individuals and firms in an economy, not sort of at the aggregate level, but at the, the very, very detailed level. It should then be the case that they if they are engaged in corrupt activities, and particularly in, in bribery, that they should get an advantage out of it. They should be favored in their location of scarce resources from the government. They should get things done quicker and so on. 
But when you do that, and there has been quite a few studies of that in, in countries in Africa, which um, done by the World Bank, which are considered, if you look at the corruption perception index, to be very corrupt places. Mm. So there's a lot of corruption taking place. And they have done a lot of surveys of uh, firms and also individuals where you ask about, have you ever paid a bribe? You find ways of asking it so they don't have to sort of legally uh, get themselves into trouble by answering the question, but you, you, you ask this sort of question. And then you can sort of look at what, what are the outcomes of that. Are firms that are paying or claim to be paying bribes, are they doing better than other firms? Are they getting things done quicker? Are they more efficient? Get the access to public services more than others? And the answer is no. In fact, it looks like it's the other way around, that firms that are doing this sort of activity seems to be doing worse than other firms. So there's a very little microeconomic evidence that uh, that this that sort of smoothing thing is actually happening and mm. that you are actually able to grease the wheels and get things done at that level as well. So I think that sort of puts another nail into into the coffin of this idea that corruption is necessary to for the smooth operation of an economy. It does not seem to be the case, even in, in, in societies where they in general is considered to be a lot of corruption and possibly also lots of inefficiencies, which would be true for many of these countries and in, uh, in Africa that the World Bank serve it for this purpose. So we've talked about um, one interpretation of corruption at quite a bit of length now. So the idea that corruption can actually be efficient and it can actually be good for a country. Um, another kind of interpretation is that corruption is still um, beneficial, but only in a second best sense. So the mm -hmm. idea that government kind of has two choices. Um, one is to root out all corruption, but that can be quite costly. It can actually have negative consequences as well. And the other bit is to allow um, officials to be a little bit corrupt, um, but thereby um, not have to spend all those resources in, in tackling it. Can you talk more about this kind of idea? Yeah. No, this is, uh, I think the, the best way to think about this is to sort of realize that when we are talking about corruption, there's sort of two things that needs to come together for corruption actually or corrupt act actually to happen. The first thing is that has to be an opportunity. That is, we need to have a public official that somehow can misuse his or her office for private gain. Right? So that's the, there has to be an opportunity. But just because there is an opportunity does not mean that everybody will take the opportunity. Mm. Uh, in fact, we can, we can imagine that maybe people have different sort of moral objections to engage in these sort of activities. There would be some that would probably whatever, would never take the opportunity. Others might be easy, more easily persuaded to, to take the opportunity if it, it so arises. So that's the one thing. The other thing is that there has to be the incentive to do it. Uh, and that does not just depend on your moral sort of inclination to engage in these types of activities. It also depends on the incentives that are provided by the organization that you're working in. And this is where this idea that uh, it might actually be optimal for a uh, government that is sort of planning how to organize its bureaucracy to set up a system that allows for a residual amount of corruption. Mm. And the reason is, as you already alluded to, is that it might be expensive and maybe too expensive to provide the incentives that would ensure that everybody... Uh, when the opportunity arises to take a bribe, would say no. Mm. And to see that, we can sort of think about what are the handles that a government can sort of turn up and down in trying to control corruption and other misuse of office in, in, a, in a bureaucracy. Mm. And there's sort of broadly speaking two things a government can do. One is to do some monitoring and then have a system of penalties. So if you get discovered doing something, taking a bribe, say, then you're going to get penalized. So that would basically be having a legal code that would say that this type of activity is illegal and there's a certain penalty associated with it. And on top of that, you need to have a monitoring system that uh, basically picks up on, uh, on people that, that are doing these sorts of activities. And there you can see that's where the cost is coming in because monitoring is expensive. Mm. You, you can't monitor everybody. That's so you have a complex uh, organization. You need to give people some discretion to do things. You cannot monitor what everybody does. So that's expensive. And of course, that's the other problem, which is that if you have a system of monitoring in, in, a context, in the context of, uh, of corruption, say, then there's the problem of um, what ensures that the monitors are not going to be corrupt. Mm. 
Mm. Well, of course, the argument will be, well, we just need somebody to monitor the monitors. <laughs> but that kind of just goes on, and we're not going to get to the end of that. Because you can imagine a scenario where somebody gets picked up for being corrupt in the police by the uh, authority that oversees the police, but what the uh, corrupt police uh, men that have been picked up there do is just bribe the next layer. Or if you get to court, you bribe the judges, right? You can yeah. basically bribe your way out of it. In that case, that solution would not work work very well and would be very expensive to set that system in. Uh, so if you balance the cost and benefits here, then it might actually be that you want to put certain resources into a monitoring system, but you don't want to go... It's not. It doesn't pay off to go all the way to make sure that there will not be anybody corrupt left in the in the mm. organization. And in that sense, it would actually be optimal to allow for some corruption, even if it was in principle possible to reduce corruption down to to zero by putting enough resources on it. So one other way to think of this is instead of monitoring costs, is that the government ends up paying corrupt officials more. Uh, can you talk about that kind of interpretation? Yeah, this is, of course, the uh, the interpretation I just gave about monitoring and uh, legal penalties. This is kind of what the lawyers like, right? This is the mm. kind of solution that they they would uh, well, come first to mind to, to somebody who is trained in law. Uh, the solution that comes first to mind to somebody trained in economics is, of course, what we need to do is to make sure we have some monetary incentives here. And a simple way of doing that is to think about the pay structure. And the reason why the pay structure works uh, to control corruption is that there's always the possibility of firing a corrupt official that's going to be uh, picked up and discovered. And if the uh, job that you have in the public sector is paying a reasonably good salary, in particular more than what you could get in the private sector if you moved over there in a similar job, then of course you, do, you have a strong incentive not to do something that would get you fired. And if you get fired, if you're caught being corrupt, then the higher the wages that we pay for the officials, the less incentive they have to take a bribe when the opportunity arises. And again, we could, in principle, set the wage so high, a so-called efficiency wage, so high that nobody would ever want to take a bribe. But again, of course, this is costly, so there's a trade-off here. For this, the cost of allowing some officials to, uh, to continue taking bribe and perhaps allow uh, firms to uh, not pay taxes or not pay the tariffs that they need to cross the border and so on. So there's some laws coming from that, which of course is why we want to weed out corruption in the first place, but that has to be traded off against the cost of paying higher wages. And the balance of these two will then decide how high a wage is optimal. So this idea is quite interesting as well because we see this pop up in other areas of economics as well. Um, so for example, Henry Ford paying the famous $5 wage to his workers and stuff, where the idea here is, is that if you pay a slightly higher wage, so workers are scared of getting fired, then they're going to be less likely to slack off as well. It's that kind of same intuition. This is exactly the same. So it's effectively coming from that. It's an efficiency wage and it's used in the, in the sort of thinking about labor contract as well, where it's nothing to do with corruption. You just want to make sure that uh, your workforce is working as efficiently as possible and putting in as much effort as possible. And one way of doing that is basically by paying relatively high wages and then have the threat of terminating the contract, which would give an incentive for, for workers to put in enough effort. So overall, this leaves us with quite an interesting conclusion, right? Where on the one hand, um, we don't want too little corruption. And on the other hand, we don't want too much corruption. There are some optimal levels somewhere in between that balances out the benefits of having less corruption and therefore a better functioning system. But on the other hand, um, trying to not spend too much money, be that through monitoring or, or higher wages, that could be sp uh, spent elsewhere. So if we've got some optimal level of corruption, that's somewhere in between, that must make it really hard to, to test empirically, right? It is. Now, so th this makes it actually, it does make it very difficult in particular to do uh, studies, which is doing it at the, at the aggregate level. But what you can still do is you can look at specific cases because there you would be able to, to, to dig in and, and say something concrete about a particular particular case. Mm. And there has been, uh, well, lots of studies that have done that, that over the years. Uh, so one sort of thing that the World Bank has started doing, well, actually started doing that in the 1990s, but have continued doing it for many years, is to do what is called expenditure tracking studies, which is another way of trying to get a handle on how much corruption there might be in a particular 
either country or in a particular project that they, they, are, they are funding in one way or the other. The basic idea is that if you are tracking the funds that are supposed to go to some particular activity, then you know how much is being released for the activity, you know how much is being received, and then you can work out how much is being lost in the middle. So they did some studies of that. In a, the, most, the first of one, one they did was on education spending in, in Uganda, where they tracked the money from the top to the bottom, mm. uh, that is from the treasury down to the schools. And because every school was supposed to get a fixed amount of money per pupil, they could work out exactly what each school was supposed to get by counting the number of pupils in the school. And then they could compare that to what the schools actually got and compare that to what was released from the center at the beginning of the chain. And they found that almost 90% of the funds just disappeared. Mm -hmm. okay, so, and they, this is kind of one way where you say, well, this is clearly a scenario where this cannot be optimal, yeah. where the resources are seriously misallocated on an activity that I think uh, all economists and all sensible people, I think, would agree on is valuable, that is educating kids. So that's sort of an example where you can get some mileage without uh, sort of running into that that problem, I think. But it does make it more difficult to do sort of more broad studies of corruption because if it is optimal, then there should actually be no effects. Yeah. Um, and if I remember right, in that kind of Ugandan example as well, they intervened actually, didn't they? They, they tried Yes, to no, that's a, so that's not... That was, uh, and so this is actually kind of a bit of a sunshine story about how things can improve. So mm -hmm. they did this study... And once they did it, of course, they, uh, they discussed it with the Ugandan government and published it as well so anybody could see. And there were some officials in the Ugandan government that really decided that this was not good enough. Mm. This, this, we need to do something about this. And what they decided to do was a simple intervention, which was just an information campaign. So they basically uh, started this campaign, which effectively told, the, uh, told everybody what the rules of the game were. That is, every pupil is supposed to get X amount of money a year. So that uh, they put that into all the newspapers on TV and on the radio. So it's basically a, a big information campaign on that. And then at the same time, they required the schools uh, to basically post on the door to the school uh, how much money they actually got. And as a consequence of that intervention, the, the uh, year after when they did another of these tracking studies, the whole thing is swapped around. So instead of 90% dis disappearing, it was 10% disappearing. And the reason for that presumably was that this em empowered the teachers and the parents to basically push back on the official that was sort of in the middle of the chain that was uh, siphoning off the funds and they just could not do that anymore. And they stopped doing it down to 10%. So that's an example of a an intervention which was actually extremely cost efficient. It didn't cost very much to, to do this at all and had a huge effect and had an immediate huge effect. Mm. So it appears we've got um, a lot of instruments that we can use to, to tackle corruption if we think that it's a, a real problem. And um, we've talked about monitoring, we've talked about efficiency wages, and just now we've talked about transparency and keeping people accountable as well. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I want to get to as well is the idea of changing culture. And the idea that people aren't just um, incentivized uh, as individuals, but they play part of this larger community or, or society that they go in. And this kind of takes us to the last interpretation of corruption, which is the idea of self-reinforcing corruption. Um, can you talk about that and what kind of different problem that poses to us? Yes. So, in fact, when, when, when we are thinking about this idea of organizing and uh, organizational bureaucracy in the optimal way, we are totally ignoring the social context when we are, we are doing that sort of analysis. We're just sort of thinking we can change the incentives for individuals and then that would uh, in itself then solve the problem. But it basically misses a very important point, which is that individuals are not working in a, a vacuum. They are in an organization, they're in a social context. And what happens in the social context has uh, big implications for the way that people behave. So the easiest way to see that is just take an example. So think about a corrupt official who is, or a corruptible official, somebody who has not taken a bribe yet, but might be willing to do it. There's an opportunity. So the, the, the choice has to be made here. Somebody offered a bribe. Should you take it or not? If you're working in an organization where you are perceived that there's nobody else that ever have taken a bribe, you would probably be very reluctant to accept that bribe because you know that uh, if anybody finds out, they're going to report it uh, 
And if you're reported, there's no way of getting out of it. Whatever the rules are, they're going to be enforced. So that will give you a very strong incentive to not take the bribe. Now put the same exact individual into a different social context where the perception is that everybody is doing this. And then the opportunity comes up for that individual to take a bribe or not. Now you can see the calculation is very different. It's the same person, but in a different context. And now the calculation is, well, if I take this bribe, since everybody else is taking bribes, nobody is going to tell on me. I'm not going to report this. And even if it is reported, the whole system is so corrupt that I can probably find a way of bribing my, my way out of that if I were to be corrupt. So that gives us basically that that same individual, depending on the social context, would behave very differently. And what this is doing is basically reinforcing behavior. So if we take the, the official, which is sitting in the, in the social situation with lots of other corrupt people, then that person has an incentive to become corrupt himself or herself. And as a consequence, more people get corrupt. And that reinforces then the social environment that the next person that gets the choice would now have an even stronger incentive to also participate in the corrupt activities. Where in the other example where the perception is that few people are corrupt, uh, it's much less likely that anybody, when given the opportunity, would take the bribe and become corrupt. And as a consequence of that, the, uh, when you say no, this whole environment becomes less corrupt. And the next person getting the choice would then have less of an incentive to take the bribe. So we get this self-reinforcing social dynamics that can, if we are sort of unlucky to get on a path where, because of the environment is sufficiently corrupt, that is actually in the interest of individuals themselves to become corrupt, we get more and more people getting corrupt, and that sort of takes us into a, a situation where everybody will be corrupt. If we are lucky to be sort of on the other path, where there might be some people corrupt to begin with, but not enough that uh, the next person would be induced to take a bribe, then over time people would stop taking bribes and we get to a situation where everything is, is, is non-corrupt and the organization works in, in that way. And this is for the same individuals, so this is basically what uh, the social context might have a huge impact on exactly what people do. Just to be clear, what we're talking about incentives in this context, is so we've got more of an incentive to be corrupt if everyone surrounding us is corrupt and vice versa. It sounds like that's not a monetary incentive. No, I, I mean the easiest, yeah, no, the easiest way to, well there could be two things, right, so there, there could be, uh, the easiest one I think is it's just a question of detection, so if the, the incentive is coming from the fact that you don't want to get detected because if you're detected there's a chance uh, you either get fired, you lose your weight, say, or you are being penalized uh, because it's illegal. Uh, so what this would operating on is of the uh, the uh, probability of being being detected is much less in an environment where everybody is corrupt because nobody is going to report this and the monitoring system might itself be corrupt. Where in the other system where nobody is corrupt, if somebody finds out, it will be the biggest news of the day and it's going to be reported and then you're going to be picked up by a totally clean monitoring system that would then take you to the courts where you can't bribe the judges so you're going to end up being penalized so that's that's kind of the incentive but it could also be much softer incentives it could just be that uh, <clears throat> if you're in an environment where everybody is corrupt uh, you don't feel so bad about being corrupt yourself so it's sort of a more behavioral response you are you're, you're quite happy to imitate what others are doing in your in your environment you might have started out thinking that this is an activity that I should not be engaging in, but given everybody else does, is how bad can it be? So I will do it as well. And it would be opposite in the other. So either way, it gives us that that uh, dynamics that would lead to two different situations. Which So what this results in is what kind of economists call multiple equilibria. But on the one hand, we've got um, this one scenario where everybody is corrupt and therefore um, I as an individual also have an incentive to be corrupt. And on the other hand, um, we've got this other world where we've got very low corruption and therefore I as an individual also have got a very low incentive to, to be corrupt. And from the way we've kind of set it up and discussed it by that kind of logic, there must be some point in between as well where we're just on the knife edge between kind of falling in between these two worlds. And then as soon as there's a little nudge in one direction or the other, then through these self-reinforcing mechanisms that you've talked about, whether it be um, through detection or through more psychological ways, and um, we then fall into one of these two other worlds.
Um, if we set up corruption in, in this kind of way, that must have really important policy implications as well that are very different from the ones uh, we kind of talked about before. Can you elaborate about that? Yes, so indeed. So uh, two ways of looking at this, uh, either sort of a positive spin or, or a negative spin. Um, basically what is needed if you wanted to uh, uh, break a situation where everybody is corrupt, so you have a culture of corruption in an organization or even in an entire society, if you want to break that, a small tweak of the incentive is not going to do anything because what will happen, say, if we put in better weight incentives in a, in a super corrupt bureaucracy, then that's going to change a little bit at the margin how individuals would behave. But because most people are still corrupt, it's just going to keep us stuck in that, in, that, in that situation. It's not going to be enough to take us out of that because that self-reign force is just too strong. So what you need instead is a big push. You need to change something fundamentally that would basically take you away from the starting point where everybody is corrupt. You need a sufficient mass of people to switch their behavior so that others get an incentive to follow. So technically speaking, as you're sort of describing it, we have the two types of equilibria in, somewhere in between. There's a threshold value. So what we need to do is basically to move uh, move the uh, organization that is on the wrong side of that threshold to the other side of that threshold. Mm. And then we would be able to get something working. But I guess the, the positive spin of it is that once we've crossed that knife, edge, That's exactly, then it takes yeah, care of itself. That's exactly. Then we get sort of a, a social multiplier on the policy, right? So they, we had the policy intervention that took us maybe into, say, a half-corrupt bureaucracy, from a super-corrupt one to a half one. Of course, we might not be happy with the half one, but once we had the half one, if that is sufficient to change the internal dynamics so that over time less and less people are willing to take bribes because less and less people are taking bribes in that organization, we can then get the transition sort of automatically without further intervention to the uh, to the other equilibrium where nobody is taking bribes. So it's kind of coming that, uh, that uh, social multiplier. So sort of the, the negative spin is that what is needed to break the... Uh, the self-reinforcing process that leads to a culture of corruption, you need a big push policy, which is difficult. But once you get one of those going, you get then to capitalize on the self-reinforcing dynamics. That is, you can get a social multiplier operating that would take us all the way down to the efficient, low uh, corruption equilibrium, which is where we want to go. It makes me think of doping in sports. You get sports where almost everyone dopes, and you get sports where not yeah. very many people dope at all. But it seems like the two equilibria mm, there's yeah. no sports in, in the middle. No, indeed. And I think that that's exactly. You can think about the. Uh, uh, I think about so think about the cycling, which uh, had a lot of doping going on uh, back in the eighties and nineties. Yeah. Uh, we probably were in a situation where everybody was taking these uh, blood products in order to, uh, to enhance their performance. Uh, so how did that get? get broken well it was kind of a big push right here where the big push was basically some of the big stars got caught in this and then others followed uh, and actually went public with their own uh, uh, misuse of the rules even without having been caught and I think that basically is an example of that sort of that you, you got you just on the right side of that threshold and now I think it's uh, now it would be very difficult I think for somebody in that sport mm. to uh, to engage in these activities because everybody is now sort of geared up to be not doing this. Mm -hmm. And if anybody does, there would be much more observation and much more monitoring on it. And it would be a lot harder to do. So that's another example of that dynamic. So that dynamics, I think, is actually very general. You can think about that in lots and lots of mm -hmm. contexts. There's nothing special about corruption. But I think corruption is one example where that dy sort of dynamics works very effectively. Um, in the realm of corruption, has there been any evidence of this? Well, the, uh, there's some evidence that, um, that culture matters, mm. um, which is kind of a necessary ingredient for this sort of logic to, uh, to, uh, to be applicable. And uh, how, do, how do we know this? Well, there was an interesting study done some years ago of uh, parking tickets, uh, unpaid parking tickets for UN officials. So if you are working for the UN, you would be in New York, and uh, you are a diplomat, and if you're a diplomat, you cannot be persecuted for, for various uh, sort of legal offenses, including uh, parking tickets. <laughs> so uh, what the study did was to look at um, the uh, number of parking tickets that were unpaid by different 
diplomats from different countries and looked at the relationship between that and the level of corruption in the country where they came from. As you can sort of perhaps guess how this would go, there's a very strong correlation between the two. So diplomats coming from countries where there's lots of corruption were the ones who did not pay their parking tickets in New York and uh, officials or diplomats from, say, the Scandinavian countries, or most of Europe, in fact, uh, would basically not uh, avoid paying their parking tickets when they get them. So that's kind of one example where there's suddenly culture seems to be seems to be uh, playing an important role. The idea, of course, being that if you're used to being in, in a country where there's a corrupt culture mm -hmm. in general, then when you move to another environment where there isn't, or at least less of it, you keep on behaving in the way that you were used to, mm -hmm. so that it kind of sticks. So this kind of shows, I guess, like half the cycle. So yeah. we can see how culture affects individuals, but we've yet mm -hmm. to show how individuals affect culture. Yes. And by the sounds of it, that's a lot harder to, to show. It is. So that, uh, that, that is difficult to do. But what you, what you can do is look at, again, specific examples. And there has been some examples where a big push policy has uh, seemed to do uh, a lot of, uh, had a lot of action. Uh, behind it. I think uh, there's a number of examples, but I think actually the most relevant one, I suppose, uh, would be an example of how you reform a corrupt tax official or tax uh, administration. Uh, now, that's, of course, a very important, in particular in country, where it's important everywhere. You want the tax authorities to work well mm -hmm. because you need to get the tax revenues collected so you can spend it on on the schools and roads and other things that you need to need to fund. So what you do not want is to have a tax collection agency that basically doesn't collect any money because the taxpayers can pay the officials to avoid paying taxes. Mm. So that's uh, something that is a big problem. And it's a big problem in many less developed countries which have that exact problem. So how do you deal with it? Well, you could try and pay the officials in the corrupt bureaucracy a bit more. You can maybe introduce some new laws that makes it even the penalty is even more stiff if you're being discovered. But that would not work if we have this idea that this is about the culture of, of, of corruption that's been embedded in the organization. So what you need to do instead is a big push. And what could it be? What is a big push in this context? Well, one big push you could do is basically to say, let's just basically forget about the old uh, bureaucracy. Let's just set up a new one, start from scratch and give them the same power to pay taxes or collect taxes, but pay the officials in that bureaucracy a lot more. So we get it started from scratch, and then of course the rules and monitoring and so on, so that it's clear that the culture that we want to have in this organization is very different from the old one, but also giving concrete incentives from the beginning for your officials in that organization to, to be non-corrupt. Then you might be able to, to switch it, and there have been some examples of that. The, the, the one I have in mind here is one from, from Ghana when they did this where they basically very successfully implemented that, that big push policy. Mm -hmm. They left the old bureaucracy in, in place because, of course, there's lots of vested interest in this. So they just let them basically uh, <laughs> keep on doing what they were doing. Of course, they were paid very little, which was one of the reasons why they were corrupt in the first place. But now they couldn't take their bribes anymore because they were, they were basically lost the... Uh, the capacity to do that because the new agency was in charge of collecting the taxes, but they could keep their job and their wages and sit in their office and do nothing, which of course over time they would then disappear, and then you got the new organization in place. And that, that seemed to, in that case, to have been an example of how you could, could change uh, sort of a bad equilibrium to a good equilibrium with a big push intervention. Cool. I'll get on to the final questions then. Um, so the first one is, um, what view have you changed your mind about? Uh, either in economics or, or otherwise? Well, yes. Uh, I haven't changed my mind about anything that has to do with corruption. I think my <laughs> my mind there was kind of set uh, out from the beginning, and I think all the evidence that I have been able to uncover has kind of reinforced the views that I started with. But there is another area where I've done research where I did change my mind uh, 100%. So one of the other things that I've done a lot of research on is try to understand how democracy came about. That is, how did voting rights get extended to more and more people uh, in sort of between 1820 and uh, the, uh, the Second World War in Europe. And when we started that project many years ago, um, we had some ideas that it would have to do with economic development, it had to do with education, it had to do with uh, possibly other sort of economic processes that had changed gradually over the, over the, over the period. Uh, 
that changed the incentives for the elites to hang on to power and would allow for these things to happen. The one thing we did not think would work is the uh, theory that suggests that it has to do with the threat of a revolution. So the idea there is that if you are a king, you have no particular reason why you want to share power with other groups of, of citizens, and in particular giving voting rights to people. There's not, no particular reason why you want to do that. But if you are facing a revolutionary situation and something really bad could happen, you might want to do it as a preemptive strike to prevent that from happening. So there's a theoretical argument to be had there, which has uh, gained a lot of currency in the last 20 years. But when we started looking at this empirically, we really did not think that this was the case. And once we had done the empirical studies, and we had done sort of a handful of them, we find exactly the opposite. The only thing that really can explain why there was this extension of voting rights in Europe during the long 19th century is the threat of revolution idea. Mm. All the other ones really have very, very little power to explain what, what happened. So that's an example where we actually swapped 100%. We came in with the prior that this is not going to work and came mm. out with the prior that oops, it actually looks like this is what really works and can explain these things. So the last question I have is what three books or papers or other forms of media would you recommend to anyone who wants to find out more about this topic or topics in general that you're interested in? Well, if you want to, to find out about the sort of corruption, uh, there's one book that I think everybody would benefit from reading, which is this one by the Ananda de Soto. It's called The Mystery, the Mystery of Capital which has a really uh, good narrative about this idea that inefficient regulation can lead to a lot of corruption. Uh, so that's one I would do. Now, if you're interested in corruption more generally, there's a very nice book by uh, Andrew Slifer and uh, Robert Wishney called The Grabbing Hand. It's uh, a collection of articles that they have written on the subject, so it's kind of a little bit advanced, but the articles are generally written in a way that you can actually get a lot of out of it without, without knowing all the technicalities, and that they gives a very good uh, overview of the of the uh, the sort of literature on corruption in in general. Now, of course, if you're interested in political economy, there's a couple of books that you have to read, which is sort of as old one Robinson's book, Why Nations Fail, for example, would be one that you probably would want to get your hands on. It's not about corruption as such, but it is about uh, failed institutions, and failed institutions are not totally unrelated to corruption. So it sort of is, a, there's a link there clearly that one can explore. Great, um, Toke Eid, thank you so much. That was Toke Eid on corruption and political economy. As always, if you want to learn more, you can read the write-up at hearthisidea.com forward slash episodes forward slash Toke. That's spelled T-O-K-E. There you'll find us go into more detail about all the topics discussed, as well as Toke's reading recommendations. We would also be really grateful if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this. If you want to give us any constructive feedback or have any questions at all, send us an email at feedback at hearthisidea.com. We love to hear from you. And of course, if you want to support the show more directly, you can also leave us a tip by following the link in the description. Thank you for listening.